Hey everyone, how are you all doing? Today we're going to go over 10 interesting facts about Jango Fett. The father to his clone, Boba Fett, and the template for the soldiers in the Grand Army of the Republic, Jango was considered one of the best in the galaxy. Not just as a bounty hunter, but as a mercenary and assassin too. Most beings in the galaxy knew they were screwed if they found themselves in the crosshairs of this merciless executioner. But what do we really know about him? We only got him from one movie. He was pretty cool but Mace Windu was even more so. So I thought I'd go over some of the interesting facts about this man with the galaxy's most recognizable face, at least with the clones, that you may or may not know. Number one, his parents were murdered by Death Watch. During the Mandalorian Civil War on the planet Concord Dawn in the Mandalore system, Jango's parents were killed by Death Watch when he was just a boy. Which is interesting because Boba would lose his quote-unquote father to extreme violence at a young age too. Soon after, young Jango was taken in and raised by a man named Jaster Mareel, the leader of the true Mandalorians, a rival faction to Death Watch. When years later, Jaster Mareel was betrayed and murdered by his second-in-command, a Mandalorian named Montross. Jango Fett exposed his treason to the rest of the faction, which put Montross on the run, but also resulted in Jango becoming the new leader of the true Mandalorians. It was during this civil war that Jango's hate of the Jedi began, as the Order had sided with Death Watch, and so not only did he have to lead his people against their rival Mandalorians, but the Jedi too, who had been manipulated into taking Death Watch's side, and they were led by none other than a master named Dooku. Jango being the killing machine that he is, did manage to take out several Jedi on his own, though ultimately the war was brutal for his faction, and in the end, he was the only Mandalorian to survive. He was arrested soon after by the Jedi and sold into slavery, much to Dooku's outrage. Eventually though, he did escape and brought vengeance to Death Watch, destroying their faction. Now if some of you are confused by that because you watched Clone Wars and there was a whole storyline involving Darth Maul and the Death Watch, stay tuned. The contradiction will be explained. Number 2. He was recruited by Dooku in a video game. In the video game Star Wars Bounty Hunter, Count Dooku sends a transmission to Jango Fett and other bounty hunters, soliciting them to hunt down and eliminate the leader of a force-worshipping criminal organization called Bando Gora. Their leader was a dark Jedi named Komari Vosa, who had once been Dooku's Padawan when they both had been part of the Jedi Order. Jango took the job and tried to stay one step ahead of the other bounty hunters who were also on the hunt. This included the traitorous Mandalorian Montross, the same one who killed Jango's mentor, Jaster Mareel. Jango went through a lot to find Vosa, including losing his ship, which required him to steal a new vessel that became the infamous Slave One. He was also able to finally avenge his mentor and kill Montross, but when he finally found the Bando Gora leader, he was captured and tortured, which is what gave him his facial scar. Though eventually he was freed by the changeling, Sam Wessel, and had his final confrontation with Vosa, which he won. However, before he could decide whether to kill the critically injured Dark Jedi out from the shadows stepped Count Dooku, who force choked her to death. Dooku then explained that the entire hunt had been a test, to see who would be worthy of becoming the template for the clone army, which Jango had proven he was. With a little more convincing, Jango agreed and the rest is history. Number 3. Jango bumped his head in episode 2 as a callback to A New Hope. On Kamino in Attack of the Clones when Obi-Wan and Jango dueled it out, after losing the Jedi momentarily, Jango hurried to his ship, Slave One. But as he boarded, he clumsily banged his head on the closing metal door as it lowered down on him. This wasn't a mistake left in the film, but rather George Lucas referring to a mistake that he made in Episode 4. Now on the Death Star in the original movie, when the stormtroopers were searching for our heroes, one of them banged his head on a doorway as he walked through it. It was a funny moment, but one could theorize that even though, by the time of the first Star Wars film, the Empire had filled their stormtrooper ranks with no clones at all. Perhaps maybe a few remained behind, but generally, it was just recruits. And these recruits weren't really well trained at all. Now the clumsy stormtrooper was related to Jango Fett, suffering from the same graceless nature when it came to walking through doors. Number 4. Jango's armor was supposed to look more like the clone troopers. Jango's blue Mandalorian armor, or 
silverish blue, was originally intended to be white like the clones. It was only much later in the development that Lucas decided to make it blue. Interestingly enough, Boba Fett's original concept armor was also entirely white. It was eventually changed to green that we all recognize today because the color would place him in the visual spectrum somewhere between the white stormtrooper armor and Darth Vader's all black suit to make the character stand apart and to convey his morally gray standing. The white armor was abandoned for both characters in the end. For Django, that was probably a wise decision too, as it would be difficult to spot the bounty hunter in any scene full of his brethren in their identically white clone trooper armor. Number five, Django Fett had a sister. Arla Fett was 14 years old when the Mandalorian Civil War spread to the Fett's homeworld of Concord Dawn. Arla and Django's father offered Jaster Muriel and his true Mandalorians refuge on their farm. When Death Watch found out, they executed her parents and she lost sight of her brother who fled. The Death Watch leader, Tor Vizsla, wanted no witnesses, so Arla was to be taken care of. Now, that's not to be mistaken with Tar Vizsla. This is Tor Vizsla. But unknown to Django, members of Death Watch decided instead to spare her and keep her as their hostage and prize. So, they branded her with their logo on her back. Eventually, she came to accept their cause and join them, becoming a Death Watch assassin. It was only when she was arrested a few years before the outbreak of the Clone Wars that she was forced to leave the faction and be placed in a mental institute on Coruscant as she was deemed mentally unstable. She remained there, in a cell, until around the time of Order 66, so about three years after her brother's death when a Jedi turned Mandalorian freed her and took her to Mandalore. But he wasn't able to bring enough of the dosages of medicine that she needed. Arla was suffering and insisted that she just wanted to forget everything. So the two of them came to an agreement. She would tell the Jedi Mandalorian all that she knew about Death Watch. In exchange, he would use the Force to wipe her memory of the trauma that she had experienced in her tragic life. Number six, Mandalore's government didn't consider Jango Fett to be Mandalorian. Here it is, everyone. Let's talk about it. Millennia of conquest and war against the Jedi and the Republic. To civil war between clans, Mandalorians had earned their notorious reputation through blood and glory. Their armor became a symbol of fear and dread. Yet, also respect. Though the design of the armor had gone through some variations through their long history, it was always recognizable with its iconic features as Mandalorian. It was the armor that Jango Fett wore, clearly signaling his lineage as Mandalorian. However, because of their hostile nature, many of the infamous warriors had been wiped out and their homeworld of Mandalore's surface had become completely inhospitable. So. The government of what remained to the Mandalorians tried to distance themselves from this bloody history. Therefore, they did not want any association with Django, who was the very personification of their militant past. So he was disavowed, called a pretender who must have stolen his armor or found it somewhere. The origin of Django's armor still remains unclear. It was made out of Durasteel and not Beskar, which at least most Mandalorian armor was. It wasn't just Mandalore's government that claimed Jango wasn't a true Mandalorian. Someone also named George Lucas agreed with them. Which brings us to the next fact. Number seven, George Lucas says Jango Fett is not Mandalorian. Remember how earlier I said that I would address the Death Watch contradiction? Well, Dave Filoni, the Clone Wars creator and one of the showrunners of The Mandalorian, commented once that according to George Lucas, neither Jango nor Boba were actually true Mandalorians. This was a huge surprise, as in the original Legends Expanded Universe, there had been created so much material detailing Jango's backstory, some of which you have listened to in this video, all of which clearly showed that he had been a Mandalorian soldier. But George Lucas decided to scratch all of that when he had Filoni make the Prime Minister of Mandalore and a member of the new Mandalorians, a man named Almec, tell Obi-Wan Kenobi when the Jedi Master brought up the bounty hunter's name in conversation, quote, Jango Fett was a common bounty hunter. How he acquired that armor is beyond me. So Jango Fett, for reasons that are as of now unknown and only known to George Lucas, he's no longer a Mandalorian. And so his adventure with Death Watch probably never happened, but I'm still waiting for more clarification and confirmation in the Mandalorian show for that, hopefully, or maybe a Boba Fett spin-off show. Number eight, his jetpack was the death of him. Now, as we saw in Mando season two, episode one, it kind of seems like his jetpack is a little bit faulty 
when you hit the back of it, he just goes flying, and it made the same noise as Boba's did when Din hit Cobb Vanth, who was wearing Boba's jetpack, it made the exact same noise that Boba's did when it malfunctioned, leading to his quote-unquote death. Now, during the Battle of Genosis, in the chaos and confusion of war, Jango Fett went out unceremoniously similar to his son's presumed fate on Tatooine. Mace Windu momentarily lost his lightsaber in the arena when he tried to avoid a large, rampaging creature called a Reek. Seeing an opportunity to eliminate the Jedi Master, Jango decided to confront Mace, but just as he did, the creature turned towards the bounty hunter and trampled him, eliminating his window of opportunity. Though he managed to kill the Reek, it was too late. Mace had his lightsaber back and charged at him, too quickly for Jango to adapt and within moments, his head was separated from his body. But moments before the fatal swing, Jango had tried to activate his jetpack, but it didn't fire, as you can actually see in the film. You can actually see sparks flying off the jetpack when the Reek trampled him. It was damaged, and so he was unable to fly away, right when he needed it the most. So, Mace got him. I kind of wonder how things would have changed if Jango had survived the Battle of Genosis, or one step further, if he had actually shot Mace when Mace didn't have his lightsaber. So in a way, the Reek kinda saved Mace's life. Do you think Mace would have stopped the blaster bolt in midair? Maybe it's time for another fanfiction. Number 9. Jango's death affected the Kamino clones. As the great bounty hunter was the template for the Grand Army of the Republic, his death caused issues with maintaining DNA stability in the clones. When five troopers had difficulty completing their training in the Clone Wars episode Clone Cadets, the Prime Minister of Kamino, Lama Su, addresses the problem with the clone troopers' drill instructors. There had been a growing number of bad batches of new clones that couldn't perform well enough to be accepted into the army. Instead, they were relegated to become maintenance workers and janitors. This was because they no longer had access to the original Django, and so they had to stretch his DNA to produce more clones. Though most came out as they were supposed to, there would be at times some batches that were deficient, and as time went by, and the DNA was stretched more and more, the Kuminoans would not be able to maintain a clone army made out of Django's template, at least. This was one of the reasons the Empire eventually stopped the clone program and began to recruit non-clones into their army, at least one of the answers in Legends. Finally, number 10. The actor who played Django Fett had no idea who the bounty hunter was. Timur Morrison, the actor who played Django and every clone character in the films, had no idea who the bounty hunter character actually was, not even Boba Fett. His audition for the role was also unusual. He received a letter asking him to meet the casting director for the new Star Wars film. By a strange coincidence, the audition location was in the same hotel where he was staying at. So, when it came time to go see them, Morrison just had to take the elevator up one floor. There was also a video camera on him, which is normal for casting auditions, but the Lucas representative just wanted a nice chat with Morrison. She didn't want him to read any dialogue or do any performance. Morrison just sat down and talked about the things that he likes, where he was from, his family, and that was it. It was filmed, and that is the video George Lucas would then watch later, when he made his casting choices. When he got the role, Morrison naturally felt fantastic, but had to immediately brush up on all things Fett related. As he said in his own words, I didn't know who the hell Django Fett was. People were like, yeah, you're Django Fett. And I was like, who the hell's Django Fett? And I'm gonna leave it at that there. Who the hell is Django Fett? Because even before Disney purchased Lucasfilm and made the extended universe into legends or you know whatever not existent, George Lucas had already made Django Fett's elaborate backstory non-canon. All we can really be certain about the father of Boba Fett is what we saw in the prequels. But with the Mandalorian, who knows what stuff is going to be added in there about Django and Boba. So, with the Bad Batch being out, and of course the abundance of popularity that the clones have amassed with the Clone Wars and so on and so forth, we all know what a lot of people thought about the clones, including fans, but of course in universe we know what the Jedi thought of clones, they were essentially their friends, they fought alongside them during the Clone Wars, until of course they turned on them and tried to kill them because of Order 66. We know what they meant to the Empire for a certain period of time until they transitioned to Stormtroopers, and we know what they meant to the galaxy as a whole, to civilians, in both periods 
Republic and Galactic Empire. And we knew, of course, that they were highly valuable assets to Kamino, property of Kamino, that is. But what did they mean to their template itself? What did the clones mean to Jango Fett? That's what we're going to learn today in canon from the Age of Republic Jango Fett in Training comic book by Marvel, issue number one. Now, in this comic, I'm not going to go through everything. I'm just going to jump into the part that's going to be the meat of the matter of this episode. But essentially, young Boba and Jango are on a little bit of a heist mission with a ragtag crew who eventually turn on them and we see just how lethal Boba is. But during this time, we see why Jango is known as the most feared and notorious bounty hunter in the galaxy. He completely usurps all of them in terms of prestige, his abilities, and his cunning. Not to mention, he looks more badass than all of them. Now, while they're on a mission altogether, we do get a little bit of a history on Count Dooku approaching Jango Fett, which I will go into right now as well because, well, it's just cool. And then I'll jump into the part about Jango and his thoughts about the clones. So, long time ago, on the moons of Bogdan, Jango is approached by a cloaked figure. I'm sure you'll find the price of Kaminoans are offering is more than fair. For access to my genetic template, Dooku tells him that the Kaminoans will have regular access. So not just a one-time thing of his DNA. He's gonna have to be stationed on Kamino, living there, and they're gonna have access to him at any time that they want. Of course, when he's not taking business elsewhere. He tells him that if he wants to even retire from being a bounty hunter, he can do so because he's gonna be paid that much. One question for you, Tyrannus. Why me? There are plenty of bounty hunters out there. But there are few who have your reputation, Django Fett both in terms of your skills and your discretion. Dooku essentially starts to lure him in and saying, think of it, you'll have a grand army of the Republic, a show of strength and power like the galaxy has never seen before. How many men can claim such a legacy? So eventually Django accepts the offer and he says, the credits are good, but there's something I'm going to need as compensation. And then of course we jump to present day on Ord Mantell where they're doing a bunch of different things. They capture a lady, I digress, and eventually the ragtag team that they're rolling with turns on them and tries to kill Boba. Always watch your back. And so while Fett is watching his, essentially his clone, his son, being almost killed by this creature, he gets a flashback to Kamino, to when the clones were just being created, to when he saw his clones being the age of Boba here. Now, of course, as we know, he just had one request, to have an unaltered clone for himself. And this, of course, was his son, Boba, so that he could teach on everything that he learned to his son. As the Kaminoan walks him through the facility and shows him his clones, he says, I do believe that this army will be our finest creation yet. As he's taken through the facility to observe his younger clone selves, he is told that not a single clone unit has fallen below combat parameters. You must be very proud. Which is the same thing Obi-Wan says to him some time later. And Django turns around and says, to my disbelief, What do I have to be proud of? Livestock bred is kinin fodder, like you said. They're your creations. So right here is what I want to talk about. Okay, so Jango Fett essentially views his clones as nothing more than something to feed cannon fire. Essentially just clones of himself bred to be expendable. Of course, hearkening back to that part with Plo Koon, not to me. He doesn't see them as his clones. He doesn't have any sort of pride or emotion over them for that matter. He just sees them as creations in a lab. Livestock. Can't get any more callous and detached than that. But for his son, who he has taught everything he knows, is a much different story. We have to remember that the clones were not taught by Jango Fett. They were taught by his schematics. So the things, the blueprints, they were essentially like a workout routine, okay? And they all followed it. A, a, a plan of how to initiate combat for this and this and this scenario. And of course, I'm sure down the line it was kind of muddied up and it wasn't all of his tactics. Essentially, they were probably put in some stuff too by the Republic or, you know, Kaminoans like themselves who thought, hey, we know some stuff too, whatever. So when it came to the clones, you know, and the clones were very efficient, they were very good, good at their jobs, they had great training. But if we want to think of clones as, you know, being so great, we got to imagine just how amazing Boba Fett must be that he had actual one-on-one -on -one training from Jango Fett. And of course, this is what we see here as we jump to present day. What kind of maniac brings a kid to a hunt and then just, uh, listen for you, such a prisoners. As Boba pulls a blaster out and just completely mercilessly kills this beast. My father says clean kills are the best, but he also 
says regular target practice keeps you sharp. That's some kid you got there, Django. Really takes after you, huh? What do you think, Boba? And right here we see that Boba is even more callous when it comes to sparing someone else's life. You know, he said he didn't seem to be in on their coup attempt, but he didn't do much to stop it either. So this just shows that he starts off not really ever as a compassionate, loving child, as far as we know from this age. He just seems to be cold-blooded, and that's all he's ever known, which is all his father has taught him, to be strong and to be cold, because the galaxy is anything but warm. He points his blaster and he says, He forfeits his share of the bounty, but not his life. Now when they head back to the Slave One, Django discusses if Boba was going to let the Rodian go, and that he didn't know for sure. And this is where it gets pretty cold. Boba tells him that he wanted the galaxy to know what happens if you mess with Django Fett, and that's why he let him go. He figured it's what Django would do. When they miss with either of us, you mean, I wasn't the one who fired those shots. Did I do all right then, even though they got the drop on me? You sure will. You trusted your judgment, and you've started building your reputation. A father couldn't ask for a better start for his son's legacy. End of comic. And I know I jumped through a lot of stuff here, but I really feel the meat of the matter was the character development that we saw with Boba, and also, of course, what the title of this video is, which is what Django thought of his own clones, which is a pretty interesting concept to me, because, you know, you think you have a million clones. I mean, most of us at least have some sort of a love for ourselves. You would think that if we have a million clones of ourselves, we would also, you know, find some empathy or, you know, feel a little something for them as well. Not only them just being some sort of a lab-created being, organism that's alive with a beating heart, but the fact that they are us, a literal clone, kind of makes you think, hey, you know, this is me. But nope, Django just sees them as livestock, being fed for blaster fire, being fed to die, which is essentially what they are, if we really want to think about it. And from his point of view, I can totally understand why he feels that way. Here's a man who is a bounty hunter, following money to the depths of the darkest parts of the galaxy, to wherever the payer sends him. Righteous, illegal, or murderous, he does whatever best interests his pocket. He is a man well known to have killed tons of Jedi in his time, so when he says they'll do their job, I'll guarantee that, then looks at the Jedi Master dead in the eyes without blinking, you know there is an immense underlying in the foreshadowing of his message. Exploring the topic of Jango Fett and his knowledge, or lack thereof, regarding Order 66, his clones knew about it, obviously, but did he? Some assume he didn't, while others assume he did, regardless of the unsurety ensuing the topic. Now, if you have read one of the Republic Commando books, it explains Jango knew a lot of this plan. Dooku told him about Order 66 when he first hired him. Fett hated the Jedi with a passion, so killing all of them was a bonus on top of getting paid for his DNA and clone training. In the book, Boba Fett, The Fight to Survive, it is established that Jango was one of the very few people who knew perfectly well that Count Dooku and Darth Tyrannus were the same person. Now, although the army was led by Dooku and Sidious, Fett's loyalty lied with Dooku. So why Jango, you may ask? Well, firstly, I'll say he wanted an army that came from someone who had proven abilities against Jedi if necessary, which they were. In the comics, Jango killed six Jedi without using weapons, which is rather silly, I agree, but it's true. The question of why Jango Fett was chosen is answered in Karen Travis's novel, Order 66, now, Mandalorians were, and I'm going to quote the book, Republic Commando Triple Zero. Before the cloning process began, the Kaminoans tampered with Fett's DNA to ensure that the clones were primarily dominated by behavioral genes that emphasize certain qualities such as loyalty, aggression, independence, and discipline in order to guarantee that the army would be more docile and less independent than their template. Getting paid a lot of money, given a clone's son, and you get to wipe out your favorite enemy, the Jedi? You can imagine Jango was on board for this. Fett was given a clone for a son and paid substantially for his work. This was his motivation. After training the army, Dooku hired him as a personal bodyguard. Now, if the question arises, what if someone else paid Jango more? I'd find it hard to say that he wouldn't switch sides, but at the end of the day, he didn't care for the Separatists or anyone for that matter. He had no loyalties to anything but his wallet. It makes me wonder, however, what if he was alive during Order 66? I think this would have drastically changed things, don't you? As no one was a better trained assassin to the Jedi than Jango Fett, considering he was the main man the Empire hired and based their clones off his DNA. Now if Darth Maul was still around, I'm sure he would have been the first choice, but unfortunately we don't get to see him in the movies anymore. If he would have survived leading up to Order 66, he would have probably shown up to the Chancellor's office when Mace Windu had him cornered, 
Ensuing in a captivating fight between the three of them, Django was no match for Windu, of course, but with Palpatine on his team, I think he could provide just enough distraction to kill the Jedi Master. Perhaps a shot of his flamethrower and some force lightning from Palpatine? It may have been too confusing for Mace. Possibly Anakin would have jumped in at that point to join Mace, which would make it even more epic and confusing at the same time. In the Legends comic Jango Fett Open Seasons, we come to see Jango's younger years, which is interesting because we've only seen so little of him in the films, and just like Darth Maul, he left a legacy that has intrigued so many fans to find out more about the galaxy's most dangerous bounty hunter and clone template. In the second issue of this four series comic, which takes place 10 years before episode 2, we are greeted with a younger Count Dooku who's interrogating a Mandalorian named Silas, as he finally breaks the man's spirit and gets him to talk after days and hours of torture. We travel back 20 more years to Jango as a teenager, in his first mission as a squad commander. Observing the briefing, we can see the early design of his suit, which was much like his peers, however, his color scheme was his own. It looks quite familiar from something we've seen in the original trilogy, doesn't it? Now we know the heritage and reason Boba chose to paint his father's armor in its original colors for himself. Now, for some added info, known as Beskar Gam in the Mandalorian language of Mandoa, a name which meant iron skin when translated, Mandalorian armor was central to the Mandalorian way of life. Due to the many species on the planet, the armor was a unifying way of bringing all Mandalorians together, regardless of origin or gender. The specific designs of the armor evolved over time, gaining more sophisticated features over the years, including the incorporation of an advanced helmet heads-up display and armor-mounted weapon systems, such as flamethrowers or wrist rocket launchers. While the toughest armor was made of Mandalorian armor, named Beskar, this was the super rare and extremely expensive armor that almost no one could afford. So Django and Boba, to name a few, used the next best thing, which was Durasteel or Duraplast which were used in clone armor. As they head to their mission and are shot down while entering the planet, Django leads his men through the woods, where they are ambushed by the Death Watch. Didn't expect that. Now, the Death Watch were these guys that were pretty ruthless. They were Mandalorians who later joined Darth Maul's Shadow Collective, which successfully took control of all Mandalore during the war. Back to the story. Believing them to have finished long ago, Django tells his team to duck. I'm gonna fill your lungs with fire as he lights up the entire section of the forest and the enemies within it. Wasting no time to see if they're dead, Django runs into the fire and does what he enjoys best. Beats the living life out of them with his fists. Don't get in my way. As Django radios into his supreme commander and the man who raised him as a young boy, the leader of the Mandalorian clans, Jaster. Whether or not they had any signs of Vizsla yet, the scene transitions to their dogfight. As Jaster tells his second-in-command, Montross, that his poor actions and disobeying of the orders has left him without a crew. Vizsla fires a powerful blast upon them, pinning Jaster to the ground. Without his jetpack, he orders Montross to get him out of there, when he is ultimately betrayed and left there to fight for his life, which was moments from being obliterated. As he does his best to prolong the fight until he can get out of there, using all of his bounty hunter techniques, he unfortunately falls to his demise. As he takes heavy cannon fire repetitively ripping through his armor and his flesh to pieces, Django sees this, the man who was like a father to him, to be destroyed before his very eyes. Django runs to him and takes his body to the rest of the crew. Kicking Monstros out of the clan, which leads us out of this flashback and back into Dooku's torture chamber. Begging for the fallen Jedi to not tell Jango that he knows, Silas is injected with a poison that stops his heart. As Dooku turns, he leaves the chamber, telling Silas that no promises can be made. From that day forth, as Jango achieved new ranks, he changed the color of his armor to match his commander, Elder and above all, the man who saved his life on that farm many years ago, Jaster. Now this video should touch base on his first set of Mandalorian armor, which is what I want to showcase, but if you want me to continue the story, it's actually pretty interesting and gives us a bit of a break from all the Vader comics and mixes it up just a little bit. So in the next issue, we get to see Jango now much older as he goes up against a group of Jedi sent to kill him. 
In Attack of the Clones, we saw the short demise of the most lethal assassin and bounty hunter in the galaxy, Jango Fett. Hired by Count Dooku on behalf of Palpatine to be the DNA host for the cloning process and eventually leading to the downfall of the Jedi through Order 66. Now, in the novel Shatterpoint, which is now Legends, however, when it was released, it was canon for the movie. In the novel, particularly the introduction, we start the chapter off with Mace's thoughts, reminiscing about a recurring dream where he says he does things right. The scene he speaks of is from the arena on Genosis with Dooku and all the Jedi that he kept hostage. We will not be hostages to be bartered, Dooku. I'm now going to read you a passage and then we can discuss it after. In my dreams, I always do it right. In my dreams, I'm on the arena balcony. Genosis. Orange glare slices shadow from my eyes. Below on the sand, Obi-Wan Kenobi, Anakin Skywalker, Senator Padme Amidala. On the rough-shaped stone within reach of my arm, Newt Gunray. Within reach of my blade, Jango Fett. And Master Dooku. No, Master Dooku no more. Count Dooku. I may never get used to calling him that even in dreams. Jango Fett bristles with weapons, an instinctive killer, the deadliest man in the galaxy. Jango can kill me in less than a second. I know it. Even if I had never seen Kenobi's report from Kamino, I can feel the violence Jango radiates. In the Force, a pulsar of death. But I do it right. The blade doesn't light the underside of Fett's squared jaw. I don't waste time with words. This part is over. I don't hesitate. I believe. In my dreams, the purple flare of my blade sizzles the gray hairs of Dooku's beard. And in the critical semisecond that it takes Jango Fett to aim and fire, I twitch that blade and take Dooku with me into death and save the galaxy from civil war. So it's interesting to see how Mace wishes he had just gone for Dooku instead of spending time on speaking, then dodging the burning flames of Jango's flamethrower. As he goes on to later say that in his dreams he always does things right, but when he wakes up, is when the nightmare starts. So why didn't he just kill Dooku when he had the chance? The novel actually goes on to explain how Yoda sensed the conflict within him regarding the events after the battle and told him he cared too deeply for the Jedi Master, how he owed Dooku respect and that's why he couldn't follow through. It makes me wonder just what would have happened that day if Mace had sacrificed himself at Jango's blaster to kill Dooku. That means Anakin wouldn't lose his arm. The Separatists would need a new leader. Palpatine would have to find a new apprentice and sure. Anakin would never have tapped into the dark side to kill him because that fight would have never taken place at the Chancellor's kidnapping. If this were to happen in an alternate universe, I think Palpatine would either find Maul again or train a new apprentice that we don't know of. Actually, you know, that might have been even cooler if we get to see Maul come back again as a battle-hardened post-Clone Wars Darth Maul to return to fight Obi-Wan under Palpatine and Anakin had to use the dark side to kill him and save his master. Actually, I think that would be really cool. Oh well, maybe I can make a good fan fiction of it someday at your request. The novel goes on to actually explain how Mace felt the disturbance in the Force, how he didn't know exactly what involvement Dooku had with Jango, but he knew something was bad and he knew the fate of the galaxy revolved around it. Actually, maybe I shouldn't say the fate of the galaxy, seeing as how Snoke has been lingering in the backgrounds. Maybe we'll learn more about him when Episode 8's trailer comes out in July. It's kind of cool how we now know that Mace regretted killing Jango and would have rather have killed Dooku and sacrificed himself along the way. At least now we know why Mace was always grumpy. He would always start his day remembering his dreams of fixing his mistakes and then waking up to reality. I wonder if he dreamed of making Anakin a master. Oh well, I guess we'll never know. Hey guys, how's it going? So, in episode 3 of The Bad Batch, Nala Se reveals that Jango Fett's DNA is no longer as usable as it once was. Now this, in my opinion, is due to the years of constant cloning and use, most likely cloning off of cloned cells. So like a photocopy of a photocopy of a photocopy, or the cells just aren't as saturated as they once were between the Phantom Menace and Attack of the Clones, when they were making the Republic's army. Now you may ask, why did they keep using Jango's DNA? What's so special about him? He's just a man. Well. For a more detailed explanation, go read the comic Jango Fett Open Seasons. In there, it shows Dooku while he was a Jedi, and we observe his point of view as he sees Jango killing several Jedi with his bare hands. His combat was immaculate, his reflexes were perfect. It was this moment that Dooku never forgot about Jango, and when it came time to get a template for cloning once he had joined forces with Darth Sidious, he suggested Jango Fett and he was the epitome of Jedi killing DNA, so it only made sense. 
Someone with his stature, reflexes, biochemistry, and abilities would be unstoppable as an army of millions. The only thing they would have to do would be to train the Django clones the same way that Django himself was trained. And the way they did that was by using Django's training protocols. So essentially, all clone troopers in a roundabout sort of way were trained by Django Fett, his methods and theory of combat and fighting, at least. Boba Fett got his knowledge firsthand, and this was Django Fett's whole point with Boba. That's why he wanted an unaltered clone, so that he would pass on everything that he knew to his son, so to speak, who would continue his legacy, which is exactly what he's doing as we see now in The Mandalorian. Now, with Django being dead, they can't just take samples of his DNA anymore. So the fixed samples that they do have are running out as they have been experimented on so many times and duplicated by the millions that they no longer are created as efficient of clones. They are now getting more watered down Django, if we think of it like that. And if they keep using that old DNA source. So they must move on to something new, something better. And this would be the mutated clones, Omega. Crosshair, Hunter, Wrecker, and Tech. Or should I say, Omega. And maybe they'll try to infuse them with some sort of force essence, which is very hard to do. They tried to use Master Sifo Dyas's force sensitive blood in Grievous, but force sensitivity doesn't work that way, as your cells must have a high enough midichlorian count to even be trained, in which then your abilities are limited by your maximum potential. For example, if Palpatine reached his maximum potential near Return of the Jedi, and Anakin hadn't lost to Obi-Wan, and he was still in his full organic body, then he would have exceeded Palpatine's powers by 200%, according to George Lucas, at his prime, despite being so much younger. Another case in point is Anakin and Obi-Wan were evenly matched, pretty much, while Obi-Wan was much older. Anakin's threshold was higher. The same goes for creating Force-sensitive clones. You must clone someone powerful first, so that they have room for that force power to grow, so that they can handle that, in my opinion. Now, in the game Jedi Knight 2 Jedi Outcast, the Empire was meddling with kyber crystals and organic tissue, organic beings, trying to imbue the force with non-force sensitives, which, as we saw in The Force Unleashed, is a daunting task that took Vader a long time, with unlimited resources and endless trial and error. Many of the Starkiller clones came out with defects. Either he didn't have the Force, or if he did, he was suffering from many psychotic episodes. I think Jango's DNA is perfect for killing Jedi, but at this point, they need to find the next candidate if they want to keep working with the Empire, something that's going to wow them. So either Boba Fett or Clone Force 99 will do, unless they create some abomination and splice genes to make some monstrosity of a being, like Snoke. Now my question is going forwards is, while Django's is the epitome of DNA that they want to use for the clone army and for the new empire, let's say, while they used it in the time of the Republic, I feel like Django's DNA at this point with newer technology could be altered in itself. So while they may be using this DNA that isn't as potent as it once was or saturated as it once was and is now watered down, Maybe they can take the DNA of other beings, perhaps other force sensitives like the Jedi that we saw that died at the very beginning of episode one, and maybe try to put their DNA or essence and mix it with Django's. And this would give some sort of a force sensitive Django Fett clone, which I think is maybe what they did with Omega or Omega. Let me know what you guys think about this Django Fett cloning thing that they're trying to do. What do you think Phase 3 is really all about? And if you haven't checked out yesterday's video about what I think Phase 3 is, go check it out. But in this video, I wanted to give you a rundown of why Django's DNA is being used so much, why he's so important, and the backstory, the, the brief backstory with Dooku seeing Django Fett in the Django Fett comic book open seasons. It's really a fantastic backstory on Django. It goes through literally his whole life. So from when he was a little kid to the point where he was the ruler of Mandalore. And that's right, he was. If you didn't know that, you gotta check that comic book out. Or you can catch my other videos about Jango Fett, how Jango Fett became a Mandalorian, and all these different kinds of videos that I've done. Top 10 facts about Jango Fett is another good one you may enjoy. But essentially, Jango is the creme de la creme of Mandalorians. He's the creme de la creme of fighters that kill Jedi. Killing a Jedi was something that only a Sith could really do 
or something only another Jedi could do. But for a mere man, a mere Mandalorian to be able to do such a thing, and multiple times, was a feat that wasn't so explainable in the galaxy. It was something that didn't make much sense to people. And this was one reason why Jango Fett was so feared in the galaxy. It was not because he was just one of the best bounty hunters around, that he always got the job done, and he was cold and callous and ruthless and had an arsenal of weapons, but it was because of his abilities to kill Jedi. He knew exactly where to strike, he knew how to shoot them, he knew which weapons would throw them off guard and not let himself be susceptible to their force abilities and their lightsaber. Now if we look at this scene from Attack of the Clones where he's shooting at Coleman Trebor, a lot of people might think, well, why didn't Coleman just, you know, block these? He did, but Django so precisely is shooting these shots in all of these specific areas and he knows what areas to shoot at, and he may have even figured out Coleman's weaknesses by his stance, by his stature, by his species. He was a very, very smart being. He knew a lot of things. He was kind of like Batman. And this is why he shoots here and here and here, and then finally, when Coleman is open, which Django opened that opening for himself, he lands the finishing shot. This is another reason why he tried to grab his blaster when he was up against Mace Windu, because he knew where to fire. But the only problem with Mace Windu is that he's extremely overpowered and he has Shatterpoint. And Shatterpoint is essentially where you can see the weakest point of a person or even a situation and know how to break it and how to defeat it. So Mace Windu is just kind of just too strong at that point. It's not really fair. But I do believe if Jango Fett did have his jetpack working, he would have made more of an effort in that situation and definitely either gotten away or not met the demise that he had, which left Boba Fett scarred and wanting revenge against the Jedi. Hey everyone, how's it going? Today's video is going to be an interesting one. It's going to go into detail about a character that many of you may not know, but you will need to know as The Mandalorian Season 3 comes upon us and even more so as the Book of Boba Fett nears. You'll see what I mean in a minute, so let's begin. Called a barbarian by Count Dooku for good reasons, the brutal, egomaniacal, yet charismatic first leader of the Mandalorian splinter group, Death Watch, was a man named Tor Vizsla, who among his many atrocities happens to also be responsible for the slaughter of a young Jango Fett's family. Geared in striking black armor with a red cape and armed to the teeth, Tor was fueled by fever dreams of galactic conquest and a return to the traditions and ways of his people's warrior forefathers. However, there was an obstacle in his path to glory. A former lawkeeper turned Mandalorian named Jaster Muriel, who had proven himself a wise and noble warrior and had quickly ascended through the ranks until he was made Mandalore the title bestowed to the leader of all the Mandalorian clans, including Clan Vizsla, which I'm sure the name didn't give it away, was the clan Tor Vizsla belonged to during this period. Jaster Muriel, the ex-journeyman protector, which is basically just a fancy name for a space cop, had set in motion reforms that he felt the Mandalorian culture should adopt and embrace. Reforms that stood in stark contrast to the goals of Tor Vizsla. And so, as you guys might have guessed, the idea of someone like Jaster being the leader of all the Mandalorians didn't sit quite well with Tor. At the time, Mandalorians had a well-earned reputation as savage raiders and conquerors, but their new Mandalore wanted to change that perception by having his people embrace a new ethical and moral code, which became known as the Super Commando Codex. This new way of thinking focused on making the warrior clans see themselves not as enslavers of other systems, but rather as a high-paid mercenary who conducted themselves with honor and distinction. To a hot-headed guy like Tor Vizsla, Jaster's reforms were seen as a direct existential threat to the history and traditions of the Mandalorian warrior culture. So he decided to pursue the title of Mandalore for himself. However, the problem was that he wasn't the only one in opposition to Jaster's rectification, so to speak, of Mandalorian culture either. The pacifist faction known as the New Mandalorians also disapproved of the concept of an honorable Mandalorian mercenary. This is because as pacifists, they were devoted to neutrality and peace above all, and they were severely opposing any form of violence and military might. 
but that just made Tor despise them even more than he did Jaster Muriel. So, gathering followers with a similar desire and craving to return to the conquering glories of their past, Vizsla set in motion the decades-long Mandalorian Civil War when he led a bloodthirsty coup against Jaster's faction for control of the galaxy with his own warrior sect, which yes, was Death Watch. Jaster Muriel and the warriors who remained loyal to him and his cause named themselves the True Mandalorians. So, to not get confused, all the names that we have so far are Death Watch, the new pacifist, New Mandalorians, and Jaster's True Mandalorians. Alright, so the True Mandalorians went into hiding as Tor Vizsla's Death Watch dispersed their forces and battled them across the galaxy. Now eventually, their war came to Jaster's former homeworld in the Outer Rim, the agricultural world Concord Dawn. This is where Vizsla's warriors continued to hunt down Jaster's forces throughout the planet, with one of their earlier skirmishes occurring near a farm that was the homestead to a family with the surname, you guessed it, Fett. This was Django's family's farm. The battle didn't go Jaster's way, so he and his followers had no choice but to retreat into the Fett's family crop fields. When the owner of the farm discovered them, he recognized Jaster, as he had replaced him as the journeyman protector of Concord Dawn after the true Mandalorian's leader had been exiled. So, the Fets offered them refuge, but Vizsla's death watch was in hot pursuit and came across the son of the farmer, Django Fett. After interrogating the young boy, Vizsla learned that Django's father was helping to hide the true Mandalorians. Taking the young Fett hostage and using him as leverage, the fanatic death watch leader, Tor, attempted to get Django's father to tell him the whereabouts of Jaster Muriel, even beating him up to a pulp to get him to talk. But still, the journeyman protector refused to give them up. Frustrated, Vizsla switched tactics and instead decided to threaten to execute him in front of his son Django. But before he had a chance to go further, one of Vizsla's men, the one who was holding the boy, was blasted away by Django Fett's mother. Taking advantage of the momentary chaos, Django's father implored his son to flee into the fields. However, several of Vizsla's men quickly pulled themselves together and ran after the boy. But before they could get their hands on him, Jaster Muriel and his people intervened, just in time and managed to save the young Django Fett. The problem was there was nothing that they could do for his family. Django's parents were killed and he believed his sister, Arya, shared the same fate. However, in fact, she was instead taken in by Death Watch and would eventually end up becoming one of them. But that's a whole nother story. That very day, Vizsla also had the Fett homestead and their crop fields set ablaze. So he believed he had finally rid himself of Jaster Muriel forever. However, in a nearby town, after two days of prematurely celebrating to their heart's content, the seeming total victory over their great enemy, the noble, true Mandalorian leader and his remaining forces crashed the party and ruined Death Watch's good time. You see, before the burning fields could do them in, Jango Fett had returned the favor to his rescuers and showed Jaster and his troops the way to an irrigation tube. This led them to a path out of the flames. So he essentially did save them. Running from the remaining true Mandalorian party poopers and their surprise attack, Vizsla beelined for a tank. But before he could take advantage of the vehicle, the young Jango Fett managed to place an explosive on the underside of the machine. And boom, it goes off. When the smoke cleared, there was no sign of Tor Vizsla's body. So, Jaster and his troops then unfortunately made the same mistake Death Watch made. He assumed, despite not finding any remains, that now their great enemy was also gone for good. It would turn out to be years instead of days before Jaster's faction discovered just how much they had underestimated Tor Vizsla. The Death Watch chieftain had managed to survive and escape Concord Dawn. Of course, in keeping with good Star Wars tradition, he hadn't done so before getting his face permanently deformed and scarred. But after having licked his wounds for a while, Vizsla was finally ready to resurface and claim his vengeance. So, he lured the true Mandalorians into a trap on a rocky and forested planet called Corda Six. What his enemies didn't know was that in a surprise move, 
Vizsla had secretly negotiated an alliance with several of the local cordons, and together, with their forces combined, they had attacked the unsuspecting true Mandalorians. Among their forces stood the 14-year-old Jango Fett, who is now considered an adult in Mandalorian society. After having lost his family that fateful day at their farm, Jango had been taken in by the Jaster Mareel himself, who was still considered the Mandalore, let's not forget. The issue is, like the dark fate that befell his biological parents, the young Jango, despite being more mature and better trained, was still unable to prevent a similar destiny from happening to his surrogate father figure. For when Vizsla finally struck directly at Jaster and his second in command, a cold and reckless man named Montras, a grenade went off that Montras just managed to avoid by triggering his jetpack. Unfortunately, the same cannot be said for the Mandalore, who was left severely wounded by the explosion. Wounded, but not completely dead. Not yet. Jaster was still able to call out Montras for help, but that was when he was in for the second bad surprise of the day. His right-hand man decided then and there almost like a Sith Lord would have, that this was the moment to betray his leader and mentor. So instead of ordering in an airlift, as Jaster wanted, Montross abandoned the true Mandalorian ruler to deal with Death Watch alone, wounded and betrayed. And thus, unable to defend himself when Tor Vizsla fired on him from a four-wheel tank, Jaster Muriel was gone forever. Montross would attempt to take the mantle of Mandalore for himself naturally, but he was exposed as a traitor by Jango Fett, the chosen heir of Jaster Muriel, after which Montross was exiled and the 14-year-old Fett was made the new Mandalore and vowed to end the threat of Tor Vizsla from the galaxy forever. He kept striving to honor that vow as he pursued the Death Watch leader through the grim and dark raging years of their ongoing war. Though Jango Fett had proved himself to be a great and strong competent warrior and leader, he made a fateful mistake when, in exchange for information that could lead Jango to Tor Vizsla's whereabouts, the new Mandalore agreed with the governor of a planet called Galadron to squash a rebel uprising that was causing him political troubles. But Vizsla was ten steps ahead once again. While Jango and his warriors were quelling the rebellion, as they had been hired to do, Vizsla had convinced the governor to contact the Jedi Order and tell them instead that the true Mandalorians were slaughtering civilians. To provide proof, Death Watch did the butchering, but the blame was put on Jango's faction. By the time Fett had realized the governor was working with Death Watch, it was too late. The Jedi Council dispersed a team led by the esteemed Jedi Master Dooku and surrounded the true Mandalorians at their camp. Realizing there was no way to prove their innocence and yet affronted by the Jedi's threats, Jango ordered his forces to attack. The battle very quickly escalated into a slaughter. A slaughter of the true Mandalorians, that is. Even as imposing and legendary as their martial skills were, even these powerful warriors must humble themselves before the Force. However, this isn't to say that the Jedi didn't suffer any casualties, either. They definitely did. In fact, Jango, in a fit of rage, managed using nothing but his bare fists, feet and body armor to single-handedly kill six Jedi before he was finally subdued, a feat that Count Dooku took notice of. And of course, fast forward, that's why he chose Jango as the template. When all the dust had settled, Jango was the only survivor left. Tor Vizsla had wiped out the true Mandalorian through the Jedi, and the governor of Galadron took Jango's armor and sold him into slavery, where he was imprisoned on a spice freighter. So it really was a terrible day for Jango Fett, but a great one for Tor Vizsla. Fett's bad day lasted for two years, before he was finally able to break out of jail and get his gear back from the governor before coming after Tor Vizsla for decades worth of payback. After getting Vizsla's location out of the governor, Jango crippled the Death Watch leader's personal starship over Corellia and used his jetpack to fly through the bridge's viewport and attacked Tor Vizsla in their final duel. They fought through the halls of the crashing ship, even into an escape pod and continued on once they had reached the planet's surface and stumbled into a river. After all this time, Tor Vizsla was a hair faster, and the instant an opening presented itself, he stabbed Jango with a poison blade right between his torso's armor plate. However, as Vizsla was savoring his victory much like Maul did against Obi-Wan, it turned out to be premature, 
as just before Django fell into full unconsciousness, it was Tor Vizsla's turn to be too slow. As in the last second, Jastamriel's adopted son and heir to his throne popped out the blade of his armor's gauntlet and cut a deep wound across Tor Vizsla's stomach. As Django Fett finally lost consciousness, the blood from Vizsla's wound drew the attention of the local Corellian predators. The spined and carnivorous feline dire cats tore into the Death Watch leader's body, eating him before he had a chance to kill Django. Django Fett was spared from being their food because of the poison flowing through his veins. They could sense it, and they left him alone. The very tool meant to have led to his demise was what saved his life in the end. Django woke up the next day unharmed. As for Tor Vizsla, well, after his death, the Mandalorian Civil War ended with him. What remained of Death Watch went into hiding across the galaxy and stayed there until they would once again carry their banners for war during the Clone Wars. And as for Jango Fett, well, he became disillusioned with the ways of the Mandalorian society and chose to utilize his unique and deadly skills as a bounty hunter once again. And we know how the galaxy changed from there, in Legends at least.